Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Lutheran Church today. I'm Pastor Josh Reefstuck. So glad to welcome you into worship today for this 4th of July weekend and our worship during it as we celebrate the gifts of the kingdom that we enjoy, the nation that we enjoy. We also look forward to that kingdom of God. And so we will be beginning a sermon series this week entitled, Who Are We? And that'll be our sermon series for the next three weeks. But while you fill out that red connection pad at the end of your seating areas, I have a couple of brief announcements to share with you today. Our Good Samaritan Fund is running low. We've had the opportunity to bless many Calvary members and Calvary families and community families through that through that resource. But if you would be so moved to bless others with the financial gifts that you have received, please feel free to make an offering for that Good Samaritan Fund. Please designate it clearly as, uh, as otherwise your offering will just go straight to the general fund. But that Good Samaritan Fund has made a big impact in the last couple of years as people experience the financial strains of, of all the things that are going on in our world and our economy. Now, second announcement I want to share with you today is that we have a facilities workday coming up. That'll be July 16th at 9 a.m. That's a Saturday. If you're able in any way, shape, or form to help out for that workday, all you have to do to be able to do is carry things. I know that the facilities team would appreciate your help with that. We'll be putting up lights in the school side and on the church side. And so, again, if you're able to help out on that July 16th, please stop by at 9 a.m. Last announcement that I want to make is a double announcement of sorts. We found out recently that our school secretary is taking a position elsewhere, so that position is opening up suddenly at the very beginning of the school year practically. So if you are able or know anyone who'd be interested in working in the school, blessing the families of our school as a secretary, please do consider applying. Details for that position are in the announcements today. And we also are looking for a new director of video ministry, Bud Flug, who's been doing that job faithfully for the past two years or so, is looking to step back from his full-time engagement in that position. Uh, details for that position are included, but if you're gifted with the ability to use and utilize technology and would like to bless Calvary members who are not able to be here on site, whether because they're traveling or because they're shut in or for any other reason, please do check out the announcements and, uh, for more details on that position. That's it in the way of announcements. So at this time, as we begin our worship, we stand for our invocation. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Because in him is gladness, our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, hear now the silent prayers of confession that we bring before you. Together we pray. Gracious Lord, we confess that we have not feared, loved, and trusted in you above all things. We have allowed other things to distract us from your presence in our homes and your mission in our lives. We have not extended your saving love to others as we often as we ought, choosing to keep your good blessings to ourselves instead of sharing them with those around us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord. Fill us with the Holy Spirit that we may worship you with joyful hearts and proclaim your kingdom all our days. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. His kingdom has come near to you and and you are blessed to be part of his mission and ministry. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, it is my joy to proclaim Jesus' words of peace to you, and by his authority I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. For our children's message, we invite our children to come forward. For our children's message at this time... Good morning. All right. I've got a question for you both this morning. If I say to tell Pastor Sam he preached a good sermon, if I tell you, Theo, to tell Pastor Sam he preached a good sermon, do you, do you go say, Pastor Sam, My dad says you preached a bad sermon. Is that what you're supposed to do? Were you supposed to tell him he preached a bad sermon? No. No, you're supposed to say what I told you to say, right? You don't want to tell a lie. You don't want to represent me incorrectly. You don't want to say I said something when I said the opposite. Today, Jesus tells us that we should speak for him, that we should represent him to others, that we should tell other people about his kingdom. But what is Jesus' kingdom like? What is a kingdom? This is, this is a big problem. If we're supposed to tell Jesus, the people around us, what Jesus' kingdom is like, and we might not even know what it looks like. Man, you said you didn't know what, a, what his kingdom was like, right? Well, that's a bit of what we're going to talk about today. What is Jesus' kingdom like? Well, I'll give you a bit of a hint so that you can begin telling the people around you about Jesus' kingdom. Because Jesus wants to, us to tell everybody around us what his kingdom is like. When Jesus is telling people about his kingdom, he goes and he heals them of sickness and disease and problems that they have. He does all kinds of amazing things like giving out free food and he teaches them. He loves people because Jesus' kingdom is a place where people don't go hungry. Jesus' kingdom is a place where people are loved Jesus people is a, Jesus kingdom is a place where people don't get sick anymore and where people don't die anymore too. Jesus kingdom is a place where everything good happens and nothing bad happens. And we can tell everybody we meet about how wonderful that kingdom is. 
today, you get to go out and you get to go talk to your parents about Jesus' kingdom. And maybe you'll get an opportunity to talk to your friends about Jesus' kingdom too. But either way, know that Jesus' kingdom is for you. And one day, Jesus will take you to be with him in his kingdom. In that kingdom, you'll enjoy all of those blessings as well. And so, let's pray now and thank God. Let's fold our hands and bow our heads. Dear God, thank you for the blessings of your kingdom and for sending Jesus to tell us about that kingdom. Help us to tell other people, everyone who will listen, about all of those blessings too, the good things that we will enjoy because you give them to us freely in your kingdom. Help us to share the news about your kingdom well so that others can know and enjoy it too. These things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can return to your seats as we sing our next song. Our first reading this morning comes to us from the book of Exodus, chapter 24. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders went up, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel, and beheld God, and ate and drank. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain, and wait there, that I may give you the tablets of stone, with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses rose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountains of God. 
And he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we return to you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute, let him go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand for our shared confession of faith using Luther's words from the small catechism. The second commandment tells us, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not curse, swear, do satanic arts, lie or deceive by his name, or call upon him in every trouble, praise, praise, and give thanks. Please be seated for our hymn of the day. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Since Pastor Ebert and Pastor Sam are both on vacation for the next three weeks or out of town at very least, I resolved to make a sermon series out of the opportunity. As I read through the assigned readings for these three weekends, I realized that all of the gospel readings are from Luke chapter 10, and so I had a natural candidate for my study But when I looked at them, I had a bit of a problem. There's very little that naturally seems to connect these three readings together. And yet, the more I stared at them and the more I looked backwards into Luke, especially at Luke chapter 9, the more I felt that Luke had an underlying logic, or maybe better, Jesus had an underlying logic for why he did the things he did and why people responded to him the ways that they did. See, a lot goes on in Luke chapter 9. Go back just one chapter, 
and Jesus sends out the 12 apostles. He perplexes Herod. He feeds 5,000. He hears Peter's confession that he is the Christ. He foretells his own death. He tells the disciples to take up his cross and follow. He goes up on the mountaintop and is transfigured before Peter and James and John with Moses and Elijah up there as well. He then comes down from the mountain and demonstrates his majesty, according to Luke, as he casts out an unclean spirit. After that, he foretells his death again. He follows that up by arbitrating an argument among the disciples about who's going to be the greatest or who is the greatest. After that, they have another argument which which Jesus has to arbitrate about whether people besides the disciples should be casting out demons. After that, apparently an entire Samaritan village was fed up with Jesus and they reject him and throw him out of town. And it's only then, once we've covered all of those things, that we come to the 13th major event in Luke chapter 9, where Jesus talks with those three people that Pastor Ebert preached on last week, all of whom want to follow, and yet all of whom Jesus, well, he makes it sound very difficult to follow him. He talks about the cost of discipleship and how they're going to have to to not have a home, they're going to have to do all kinds of difficult things, and they all go away sad. All of that is in Luke chapter 9. And it's not that Luke chapter 9 is an especially long chapter of the Bible. It's a normal-sized chapter. It's just action-packed. It's dense. It's full. Jesus is is a dynamic force to be reckoned with in Luke chapter 9. So where where is Luke leading us? Where are we going with, with this amazing series of events? What's the narrative progression, if you will? Well, the Jesus of Luke 9 is larger than life. And then he comes to us. After doing all of those amazing things, demonstrating his glory on and off the mountain, he comes to us and asks us to follow him. And we're left saying, man, Jesus, I don't know if I can do all of that. I don't know if I can be that amazing, be that dynamic, be larger than life like you. And I think Luke wants us to come to this realization. He wants us to feel daunted by the weight of discipleship, the costs of discipleship, the difficulty and impossibility of fully following Jesus. He wants us to ask if we're going to be followers if we're going to follow that, what, are, what is that going to look like? Or, to use the title of the sermon series, if we're followers, then who are we? Who are we to be? What are we to look like? Well, over the next three weeks, we're going to try to answer that question. Using three separate moments in Jesus' ministry, all of which occur back to back to back in Luke chapter 10. For these are a bit of an answer to that who are we as followers question. This week, we'll see Jesus send out the 72 disciples into ministry. And as he does, he sends them to be his royal representatives. Next week, a lawyer comes to Jesus wanting to know know the answers to some questions. And Jesus, well, he, he gives him a challenge to be both, a, both ruled and a reconciler as he tells the story of the Good Samaritan and encourages this lawyer to love. Finally, in our third week, we'll hear the familiar story of Mary and Martha, where Jesus reminds Martha and us that we are mere recipients of righteousness. Whatever else we are as a follower of Jesus, we are always recipients of righteousness. These three answers begin to approach this question from three different angles. The first answer, the royal representative's answer, answers the question of who are we in relation to society? The ruled reconciler answer answers the question of who are we in relation to the individual people that we meet on a daily basis? How are we to behave when we meet an individual in our life? 
who doesn't know the kingdom? And the third answer, that we are mere recipients of righteousness, answers the question of who are we in relation to God? As we come through these three, and I look forward to looking at them, we'll, we'll begin to unpack it. But today, today we're going to answer just that first question. Who are we in relation to society? We are Jesus' royal representatives, just like those 72 disciples. Now, you might not be terribly familiar with this story. If you want to learn about mission and Jesus' commission to us as his disciples, if you want to dive into what it means to be a disciple, I think it's much more normal, much easier to dive into Matthew 28, that great commission, go and make disciples of all nations. That one is shorter, it's simpler, it has a lot going for it in that regard. If you want to learn about the kind of possessions that Jesus' followers should have, if you want to understand what it should look like to be a servant of Jesus, I would suggest Luke chapter 10 is not a great candidate. Because in Luke chapter 10, Jesus says a lot of different things about what it means to be a disciple. He tells us not to take an extra cloak, not to take an extra anything. But unfortunately for us, if if we want to use this as our model, Jesus supersedes all of these commandments, directly supersedes all of them, and says, you know what I said back in Luke chapter 10? They no longer apply when we get to Luke 22. Just 12 chapters later, he says, disciples, things have changed. Things are going to be different now. And so even in that regard, Luke chapter 10 is probably not the most popular of passages. And the final nail in the coffin for why we might not typically read this sending of the 72 is simply because people tend not to be excited about the times when Jesus preaches woes. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Woe to you, Chorazin. These kind, of, these kind of moments in Jesus' ministry are uncomfortable because we don't want to hear the woes for others or for ourselves. And yet, with all of these reasons not to read Luke chapter 10, why are we reading it today? Not just because it's an assigned reading, but because, well, there's a lot for us to unpack about what it means to be a royal representative. And we're going to progressively go through this reading in the, in the coming minutes here, as we look at what it means to be a royal representative, as Jesus unpacks that for us. But we'll see that Jesus has quite a few answers to give, quite a few things for us to ponder this morning and in the weeks to come. First, Jesus in this passage sets expectations. Luke says that we, Luke and Jesus remind us that we as royal representatives, like it or not, are few. We're few. He says, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others, 72 disciples, and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, this part of the sending of the 72 is probably one of the most familiar. If you know any part of this passage, you probably know this one. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And the longer I'm in ministry, the more I see the truth of it. There really is a lot to do and seemingly not enough people to do them at any given point. We don't have an abundance of volunteers for every last volunteer opportunity that we might have in the church. We are a very blessed congregation when it comes to volunteers and engagement. Our congregation is active and involved, and I've very much appreciated that fact. But whenever we as a congregation choose to do one thing, we seem to be choosing not to do ten others. When we engage in one ministry, we're choosing not to engage in ten others, and that's just a reality. We have a limited supply of manpower and a limited supply of everything that goes into the work that we do here. Now, we love to be doing more. And believe me, the pastors would, would all love to be doing more. But 
If you've ever, ever asked the question, why don't we have a food pantry or why don't we have a homeless shelter? Well, the answer is probably largely because we have a school. We have a school and the safety of our kids is a major important part of our mission and fulfilling that mission well. We collect food, but we send it elsewhere for, that, for their food pantries. We collect donations like the Perry Township and school supply donations that we're collecting right now. We collect medical supplies for St. Thomas right now. We do all of these things. But our school changes everything else we're going to decide to do. See, if we as a congregation were 100% engaged, if every last member of the congregation was on a ministry team and active on that ministry team, and we were all out in the community serving in dynamic and powerful ways, the sad fact of the matter is we are few relative to the problems of this world. We could all be active and we'd still fail to meet the needs of our community. We could all be 100% active and we'd certainly meet the needs, we'd fail to meet the needs of this city and the state and the world. All of this is not to say we should stop working. We should stop pushing. We should stop trying to meet these needs and to be those royal representatives that Jesus has made us to be. But it's to provide that sobering look at reality that the work we do Whatever we choose to do is going to be hard. The work we do, whatever we choose to do, is going to be bigger than us. And the work we do, whatever we choose to do, is going to need a little bit of help <laughs> and a lot of blessing. The harvest is plentiful. Yes, let's go out and jump into the harvest, but the laborers are few. Know that what we do needs your help. What we do as a congregation needs the engagement of the congregation to meet these needs. And we have a great opportunity set before us. Jesus tells these disciples all of these things to start out. This is the very beginning. You are few. But that doesn't mean the work is not worth doing. And it doesn't mean that they should split up and try to go it alone. Jesus makes very clear, don't be an island. So he sends these disciples out two by two, go together. And this should be a reminder for us that we need our brothers and sisters in Christ. We need the, the cooperation that comes from working through ministry teams and working with others, engaging our ideas and our hopes and our dreams for this congregation with one another. Now, again, all of this is just the beginning, but as Jesus continues, to warn these disciples, these 72, about what it's going to be like, he reminds them, or maybe I should say warns them, that we are not just few, but we are mere lambs in the midst of wolves. He says, go your own way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. And it doesn't take much imagination to envision what that would look like in real life. A lamb in the midst of, of a pen of wolves, surrounded by wolves, is not going to last very long. This is, this is a brutal image, especially when we take into consideration the fact that Jesus is saying this is true about us. When we go out into the world, we go undefended and weak and unable to fully defend ourselves. It's bad enough that this is true for me or for you. This is true for our kids too. This reality is not just physical danger. It's, it's spiritual, it's emotional, it's mental danger as well. As we go out into the world, we go as lambs. And this is, this is why Bible study, prayer, the family devotion time, Sunday school, church attendance, it's why all of these things are so important why we go two by two. It's why Jesus gives us all of these encouragements because we need in a dangerous world that full armor of God that he can provide. We, as we go out, we know that we cannot fully defend ourselves against all of the evils of the world. We need the help of the one who is, as the psalmist says, our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. 
These are all sobering warnings. And you might wonder, well, Jesus sends out these 72, why would they even want to go? Well, the answer we get in the very next verse. Jesus says, whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. As Jesus says all of this and continues his commission, he gives the first sign of, of true good news to these 72 disciples, that we are peace. Man, doesn't that sound good in our world today? A world which, which seems to be at, its, at the throats of family members and neighbors and friends, which, which just can't get along and won't get along, and especially in the last couple of weeks, is at war. It's a beautiful prospect that our King sends us to be and bring peace to this world. But I'd like you to note, <laughs> sinners that we are, embattled as we are, does Jesus send out these disciples to be peace only for people who are baptized? Only for, for people who fully understand, who've gone through the new members class? Those who've said that the proverbial sinner's prayer? No, of course not. Jesus sends these disciples out to be peace and to speak peace first. First, before people have had a chance to understand, before people have had a chance to earn it, they lead with peace. And we're challenged to do the same, to lead with peace in our relationships with the people around us. And yes, people might send that peace straight back to us and say, I don't want a thing to do with your peace with the peace of Jesus. I don't want to mess with it. But we lead with peace anyways. We offer it fully and freely anyways because that is the kingdom that we're inviting people into as Jesus' royal representatives. When a person of that other political party walks through these doors, are you a partisan first or a royal representative? first. When a person who doesn't quite look like the, they belong here walks through those doors, are you a royal representative first? One who, who offers peace first before it has been proven that they've earned it. I pray that we all in this congregation would strive, strive to lead with peace. Whether, whether we recognize a person who walks into these doors or not, that we would say, I'm going to start with peace. But Jesus is not done. Next, he gives some more restrictions. He says, remain in the same house when you enter the house of those people that you proclaim peace to. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. And whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Now, as a person who has gone on many a choir tour, what Jesus is saying here is terrifying. Sometimes on choir tours, you're getting good houses. Sometimes you're getting not so good houses. Sometimes you're being offered good food. Sometimes you're offered bad food. Sometimes the house is clean, and sometimes there's dog hair in the bed and in the tub, and the water doesn't drain. And when you're eating your breakfast, you notice that all of the food that they've offered to you is expired. What Jesus is saying here is terrifying. But he sets these ground rules for these disciples, not just to scare them, but because we are and have to face the reality that we are sinners. In relation to the world, we, we might be peace, but we are still, just like everybody else, sinners. 
And these restrictions that Jesus places upon the disciples to eat what's offered, to stay wherever they're placed, are safeguards, guardrails, boundaries to make sure that they are mitigating the dangers of their sin. What good is a representative? Even in our system of government, what good is a representative who wants to take advantage of their position, who wants to receive the full benefits of of bribes and, and the ways that people try to influence representatives for their own pet projects, their own ideas, their own interests. Jesus knows the danger that bribery bribery poses. And so he sets safeguards in place to try to avoid these disciples seeking what's best for me. Now, as I said at the beginning, most of these safeguards, these restrictions, are superseded come Luke 22. They no longer apply. But you and me, we're still sinners, right? We still have our own weaknesses and our own temptations and our own struggles that we recognize are unique to us sometimes. Do we have any boundaries in place in our lives to avoid sin? How about any boundaries in place in our lives which are there because we know that they're going to diminish our effectiveness as disciples? We have lots of opportunities to look at our lives and soberly reflect on our own problems, our own weaknesses, and say, look, I can't handle this even though everybody else can. I'm going to avoid it. We might not need these exact restrictions but we might still recognize the value of boundaries, limitations, and guardrails. Something to think about. But as we think on the ways that we are sinners, as we reflect on our own struggles, we also have the blessed opportunity to hear what Jesus says next, that we are proclaiming the kingdom Jesus says, heal the sick in it, those houses you visit, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Like ambassadors, these 72 disciples go out into the, and to meet representatives of a foreign country, citizens of heaven, as Paul describes us. We go out to share as ambassadors the coming king and his kingdom. We come to let people know that Jesus is coming. He's coming again. And we share in that same message that the kingdom of God is coming and we are his messengers and that kingdom is going to be good, wonderful even. As much as we celebrate this weekend, especially the blessings of freedom, the blessings of this country, all of the realities of what we enjoy here, we as the royal representatives of Jesus have that opportunity to say, a kingdom is coming which is better, which no longer has these partisan politics and no longer has these disagreements and no longer has corrupt politicians and no longer has any problem at all For that kingdom is ruled by Jesus Christ our Lord. In that kingdom, there's no sickness, nor suffering, nor death. In that kingdom, we have a good king. A very good king. We look forward to that day. But until that day, we few, we mere lambs, we sinners, We get to proclaim hope and peace to a world which perhaps doesn't even believe those things are possible. Can't imagine them happening. We get to proclaim Jesus to the world. As we wait for that day and proclaim this kingdom as Jesus' royal representatives, May the very peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand for prayer. Two updates to the printed prayers today. 
We'll be lifting up Charlie Clazing, who is hospitalized at this time. We'll also be, also be praying for the family and friends of Pat Collins. Pat passed away earlier this morning. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty Father, your kingdom has come near to us through the preaching of Jesus. He alone gives life and makes us to be your holy temple where you dwell by your Holy Spirit. Enable us to receive your word with trusting hearts, knowing that the message we hear today is the living and active voice of Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, to this day, you still send workers into your harvest field. Continue to equip them to proclaim the message of peace and salvation to all who will listen. Even when they face reflection, rejection, remain faithful to them and strengthen them through your presence. Please do the same in our lives today. Even as your church faces challenging times, remind us that your mission continues and your presence remains with us always. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Merciful King, bless our ministry and mission here. Help everyone who walks into this room to find your kingdom clearly proclaimed here. Stir, stir us up by your spirit to join you on your mission, that all may worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Healing, Lord, as we gather together at your altar today, we, we remember all those who are sick, homebound, or hospitalized, or who for any other reason are unable to join us in person. Send your spirit to fill their hearts and homes with your perfect peace. Especially we lift up today Charlie Clazing as he is hospitalized, and Jennifer Kraft, Ron and James, relatives of Rayanne Crawford as they recover from surgery. Be with them and all the doctors and nurses and medical staff who care for them. Help them to come back to fullness of health. We ask the same for Mike Harmon and Betty Hossecker and Arita Failinger and so many others who we lift up now in our hearts and who are in our printed prayers. Be with them and comfort them by your presence. Grant that same presence to Susan Hoffelder, Ed Ryan, Al Durkee, and Gertrude Hyden. Comfort them by the peace of knowing the blessings that will be theirs in your kingdom and which they can enjoy in hope even now. We ask that you would be with the family and friends of Melvin Wilson and Pat Collins in this difficult time as you have drawn both Melvin and Pat to be with you to enjoy your presence in your heavenly kingdom. We look forward to that day when you will establish your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven and resurrect all flesh. Grant the people who now mourn the joy of that resurrection, the hope of that eternal life which we have in you. For all of these and more, we lift them up saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sovereign Lord, you are exalted above all nations, rulers and authorities on earth. Today we pray for our nation as we celebrate the anniversary of our independence. Continue to bless our country and keep us mindful of your blessings. Raise up godly men and women who will serve among us and work for the common good. Place your hand upon all public servants and members of the armed forces that they may know your presence and provision in their lives. Govern us by your grace that we may experience your lasting peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy will, thy will be, be done, done on earth as it is, it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our, our daily bread, bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love, which was shown to us 
when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from death and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. On the night when he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.
Now may this body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in true faith to life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen. Let us pray. O God, the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament, and we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.